Trying to see if I can go reverse it. You pitch over like that, okay? Cut it. We'll wait for another minute before we start. Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Uday Bhano Bure. I'm an executive committee member in Telugu Association of Memphis. Telugu Association of Memphis is a nonprofit organization which is serving Mid South Telugu community since 1981. I hope you all are staying safe and healthy. First of all, I would like to thank all our frontline uh, workers and essential workers who are doing what they're doing under the current COVID crisis. And we associated with uh, Ready Newman PC uh, to facilitate this call with attorneys uh, on any questions related to immigration. Under the current pandemic, you can see a lot of people have lost their jobs. So many people have traveled out and are stuck. And so many people traveled in US, uh, parents visited US, couldn't travel back. And many of you might have questions related to what's going on with uh, extensions, denials, new uh, policies. So 
I think this is a good platform for each one of you to raise your questions and get your answers. We, uh, when we collaborated with the Trading Human PC, um, ready readily accepted uh, to take this uh, call, and we our special thanks to um, Mr. Reddy and uh, Ms. Chen uh, for sparing their time to share some insights on latest policies on immigration and take any questions from our community members. Rahul doesn't need a, a lot of introduction because he is a famous uh, for most uh, famous and well-known person for most of you. But those who doesn't know him, he is a founding partner of Freddie Newman PC, and he has been practicing employment-based immigration and several other immigration matters since more than 23 years, and he is an expert in that. His service and commitment to serve the community is very much evident from his daily conference calls and weekly YouTube live and Facebook live sessions. Uh, Mr. Reddy uh, also has another founding partner, Emily Newman. She is a, a author of a famous blog post called immigrationgirl.com. And we also have Ms. Rebecca Chen along with us today to answer your questions and provide some updates on the immigration, latest immigration news. Ms. Rebecca is also an expert in immigration matters and she has been uh, helping a lot of employers and workers in very complex immigration matters. So before I hand it over to them, I would request all the users who dialed in to the Zoom meeting. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please click on the raise hand and I'll unmute you in the order I receive so that you will be able to answer the, uh, ask your questions and get your questions answered. And if we have time and if time permits, we'll take some more questions from our YouTube live channel as well. So uh, before I hand it over uh, uh, to Reddy, I think uh, uh, we'll request Mr. Reddy and Ms. Chen to share some of the latest updates on immigration and then later on take Q&A. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, ready and Ms. Chen. Thank you, guys. I was to want to first go with the frequently asked questions that we get um, uh, with our. Um, give me one second, guys. I'm having some technical difficulties here. Give me one second. Uh, we just want to go through, go to some of the frequently asked questions. My name is Rahul Reddy. Along with me is my business partner, Rebecca Chen. Um, there are a lot of rumors that are spreading around and we want to dispel certain things and give the accurate information to the people. Um, we have seen that in the middle, middle of the night, you know, president comes and tweets uh, that he's going to ban all immigration and then creates a fuss and you know, people panic and start calling at 12 o'clock in the night. We had to conduct a conference call uh, in the middle of a night and uh, hundreds of people showed up at the conference call because they're panicked. Um, I just want everybody to understand that this country is ruled by law. It cannot be ruled by Twitter. So the president can tweet what he wants, but if he wants to act on the thing, what he tweets, there are limitations. There is something called parliament. We here in the United States call it as Congress. Law, there is absolute authority. Is the Constitution next comes the uh, next comes the uh, next comes the uh, legislation passed by the Congress. Then comes the regulations. There are certain procedures that need to be done. Then fourth comes the executive order. So executive order cannot violate the regulations, cannot violate the uh, uh, law, cannot violate the Constitution. It is number four in list. So any executive order which uh, the administration want to pass have to abide by the three more superior things that are there. Um, Rebecca, can you, uh, can you address some of the things what your clients are asking you recently uh, because of what's going on? I mean, there are, uh, initially, you know, a lot of people said there are a lot of rules that have been relaxed. Are there any rules that are relaxed for the non-immigrants because of the COVID situation? No, not really. Um, there was a kind of misconception in the early weeks, I would say, of the uh, of the lockdowns and the stay home orders. 
um, where there was a mistaken uh, assumption by a lot of visa holders that given the pandemic that visa expiration dates or work authorization expiration um, wouldn't be strictly enforced because of everything that's going on. And that is not the case. All the rules and regulations related to visa expiration, um, being out of status, unlawful presence, unauthorized work, those rules are still all in place. Really the only uh, provisions that the federal government has made uh, for immigration applications in light of the pandemic is uh, first uh, giving um, an additional 60 days for RFE response deadlines, um, not for visa expiration or work authorization, just to respond to a request for evidence. If you received one, you have an extra 60 days to submit the response. And they've allowed photocopies of signatures on forms rather than original signatures. Those are literally the only uh, provisions that USCIS has made um, as a result of the COVID pandemic. So all the uh, rules about uh, visa expiration, if your uh, H-1B visa or H-4 visa or EAD card is expiring June 1st, it still expires June 1st and you need to get an extension or renewal application filed on time um, before the I-94 or the EAD expires. Those rules are still in place. Um, there has been a lot of misinformation. It hasn't, the situation, I and mean, we understand, you know, especially for visa holders, you're not only worried about your health and your employment, but your immigration status. And it has not been helped by a lot of misinformation, not only um, from the White House sometimes, but also from media outlets that misinterpret statements that USCIS makes. Um, another frequently asked question that we've been getting is um, about these reports of an automatic extension of 180 days or 240 days of work authorization. So it is correct that last month USCIS made a statement regarding what people with an employment-based visa can do to basically take care of their visa status while in this national emergency. However, that statement did not give any, it did not change any rules. Um, the statements the USCIS made um, are, were the existing rules. They've been in place for years. So that 240 day rule that kind of got circulated and sort of misreported, it is not an automatic extension of work authorization for everyone during this time or visa status during this time. The 240 day rule, which has been around for years, basically says that if you are in certain visa statuses, H-1B is the most common one that we deal with. Basically, if your H-1B uh, expiration date is April 1st, for example, um, if your employer is going to extend your H-1B and they file the H-1B extension application on time before April 1st, then your work authorization is automatically extended for 240 days based on the pending extension application. So that's the key there. The 240 day work authorization is based on a timely filed uh, extension application that was filed before your I-94 expires. It doesn't apply to everyone and it's not, it doesn't apply automatically. It's based on a pending extension application. So you still need to get applications filed on time, you still need your extension and renewal applications filed on time. And that 240 day rule has always been there. Um, there were also reports of uh, 180 day kind of grace periods or that sort of thing. That is also not really accurate. Um, the 180 day rule is related to a provision that's also been around for years that basically if you fall out of status or if you go, if, if you start accruing unlawful presence, which is a very technical term, basically if your um, application is denied while your I-94 is expired, you start accruing unlawful presence. Um, if you are in the U.S. unlawfully 180 days or more, 
and then you leave the country, there's a three-year bar applied against you. You're not able to re-enter the U.S. for three years. So that it sounds like that's where that 180-day rule um, or rumors of 180-day grace period came from. It is not really a grace period at all. Um, we understand that, of course, international travel right now is very difficult, if not impossible. So people who are in a situation where they are running out of time on their I-94 um, or worst case scenario, their pending application has been denied and their I-94 is expired. In that case, usually they, our recommendation would be for them to depart the U.S. and obviously right now they can't. Um, our recommendation is still is not is to not do nothing. Basically, just the fact that there's a pandemic going on doesn't mean that you know it's excused automatically. We're recommending in those situations that people file a B two change of status application. It's not really anything that we would have done before this pandemic because there was always the option to depart the U.S. in the past. The B two application, which is the application for visitor status, it's basically a good faith gesture to the government saying that I'm aware that my visa status is expired or expiring soon, and I don't intend to stay here unlawfully, and that I'm submitting this application for temporary B2 status because my intention is actually to depart, but I physically cannot. So we've also filed those or guided people to file those for people who are actually visiting, relatives, parents who you know traveled here when the situation was fine, they intended to depart on time before their six months were up, but were unable to afterwards. We've also recommended B2 extensions in those cases. So uh, the main thing to keep in mind is to make sure you're still filing applications on time and, uh, and to not assume that everything is okay or that everything will be excused just because of the national emergency. Technically, USCIS has not guaranteed any grace periods or anything like that right now. Executive order. Now, we have been told, Rebecca, that he is going to ban all immigration. What did he told on the Twitter and what did he actually issued on the executive order? Um, it definitely seems to be completely different. Uh, in the executive order seems to be only limiting the permanent green card holders that intend to come into United States through consular processing. Mostly in the employment based, about 80% of them don't come from the consular processing. They always come through the adjustment of status in United States. So at this point of time, the immigration hold is only for permanent green card applications that wanted to apply outside the country in the consulate. So it does temporarily for a period of 60 days restrict the family immigration, restrict the business immigration, only those people who are coming into the country, especially those people who are applying for the green card applications in the consulate. So, so only 15 to 20% have uh, of the employment-based applications do go to the consulate. When it comes to the family immigration, 80% of those preference categories, what the Trump administration wants to limit, come from the consulates. So practically, this is not a big hindrance for the people. Anyway, most of the consulates are closed right now. So it doesn't look that it harms anybody, except that it created a lot of far among the people, fear among the immigrant people, especially with the tweets and all those things. So let me ask a couple of questions to Rebecca to make sure um, what are the things these executive orders has prohibited and what have not. So I'm going to ask her the question she's going to answer. Uh, Rebecca, at this point of time, can a non-immigrant visa applications be filed, like H1, L1, T1, uh, E3, B2, uh, can they be filed with the USA, USCIS right now? after the executive order? Yes, absolutely. Can a non-immigrant visa application, applicants can be submitted to the consulate? Can they apply for the visa status right now after the executive order? Yes, temp actually the executive order does not affect H visa applications, B visa applications as temporary visas at the consulate can still be applied for the main 
obstacle to that right now is the fact that consulates are closed or you know not accepting in-person interviews due to the health situation. Uh, yeah. Once they do start opening, you could technically apply. Sorry. Um, can non-immigrant visa people who have visa stamping like H1, O1, P1, Q1, H4, L2, L, L1, L, um, can they enter into United States uh, right now or is there a restriction on it right now? The only restriction for people with those types of visas from entering right now is whether they have been physically present in one of those 14 countries that were in the presidential proclamation from March. So those are um, mostly Europe, China, um, and the Schengen countries in Europe. So that is mostly due to the COVID situation. But if you are not otherwise um, ineligible to enter based on, you know, having been in those countries within the past 14 days, then, and if you can get a flight to the U.S., then yes, you can enter the U.S. on any of those visa statuses. Can an adjustment of status be filed in the employment-based category if the priority date is current right now? Yes. Can a uh, e, e, family two applications file an adjustment of status if the priority date is current right now? Yes, if they're here in the US, they can apply for adjustment of status. Uh, can a POM application be filed right now and I-140 be filed right now? Yes. So, okay, so practically for most of our people who are listening, I mean, nothing has affected except that the consulates have closed. And if you travel to Italy or some other countries, there are some restrictions that are there, but nothing much has been changed. Um, what, what are the possible side effects of this executive order, Rebecca? Yeah, so even though the direct effect of the executive order on immigrants here in the US right now is very small. The direct impact is very small right now. There was one section of the executive order where the president basically directed the heads of the uh, Homeland Security Department, State Department and Labor Department um, to make recommendations to him within 30 days of what else can be done to basically protect American workers. So we we read that as the president asking the heads of these agencies. So that includes USCIS, DOL, which processes LCAs for H-1Bs as well as the PERM applications um, and the State Department, which heads up the consulates. You know, those do have a direct impact on a lot of people's application. Um, the president is basically asking those agencies to make recommendations to him of additional measures that can be done to protect American workers. So. We are anticipating that there could be additional requirements added to those applications in the coming months. Not that those applications would be eliminated completely or that those visa categories could be eliminated completely because the president and those agencies do not have the authority to do that, only Congress does. Um, but they could definitely make the application process more difficult or more uh, more time consuming or longer. Um, one thing that we are possibly anticipating is there may be additional attestations location requiring employers to basically confirm that they have not displaced American workers um, as a result of hiring or applying for this H-1B worker or other types of non-immigrant visa workers. So there's a possibility of something like that um, another possible side effect is that, as Rahul mentioned, because the executive order right now directly impacts primarily family-based green cards at the consulate, if those green cards do not get used in this fiscal year, basically by October of this year, if there are family-based green cards that are not used up as a result of the executive order, those unused green cards would automatically spill over into the employment-based visa, immigrant visa category, so employment-based visas for the next fiscal year. So what that translates into is that there's a possibility there could be forward movement in the EB categories. So, so Rebecca, you're telling this executive order is probably good for Indians, actually, because Indians don't use that much family immigration. They use mostly uh, business immigration. 
Yeah, that could be an unintended or sort of a side benefit as a result of the executive order. So if this continues as Trump administration always continued the executive orders, this is going to be good for Indian nationals who are waiting for the green card for a long period of time. Yeah, it may result in forward movement, especially for EB1 India, which has been backlogged. Backlog to 2015. Mm -hmm. And maybe if there is a spillover from EB1, then they could actually spill over to EB2 and EB, EB2 particularly, though not to EB3, but, but it, there may be spillover in EB2 if the things continue further. And this you're expecting starting from next year, is right? October 1st. Right, the next fiscal year, which starts October 1st, 2020. Um, can you, uh, the, I want to explain about the bipartisan bill, guys. Um, there is a legislation that is uh, going to be passed, hopefully, though, that they're expecting to give extra 40,000 green cards, um, out of which 15,000 will go to nurses. Uh, sorry, 25,000 will go to nurses. 15,000 will go to physicians. It will be allocated based on the priority date. That means that whoever might have had an I-140 with an earlier priority date will get the preference. It will not, they will not consider country of birth, which is good for Indian nationals and Chinese nationals particularly because they are being hit with the, uh, their backlog because they are born in their, respective, in, their, in their respective countries. But this bill does not consider country of birth, which is good. Um, also, this is only limited to physician and nurses at this point of time. Um, we don't, please do not expect anybody else like physical therapist, occupational therapist to be in, uh, included uh, in this one. Uh, it is by far expected to be passed pretty soon because um, most of the people uh, are supporting, the congressmen and senators are providing because of the COVID right now. We're not seeing anything, it's TV, even PowerPoint presentations or the Zoom things, everything is about COVID. So most probably this is expected to pass. Uh, so that will do a good job for the, uh, it will do a good job for the, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the nurses and the, and the, and the, doc and the doctors. Um, there have been a rumor recently that three senators wrote a letter to practically put some restrictions on the H1B and also eliminate the OPT um, and, and, and put a lot of restrictions on the employment base. Can you comment on that, uh, Rebecca? Is that going to be true? Is, is this, can that become a law? What senators wrote in the letter? Um, most likely not. Uh, so it was a letter from um, a handful of senators to the president, um, urging the president to basically suspend what they called the guest worker programs, including H2B, H1B, OPT, for a period of 60 days um, in order to allow the US unemployment rate to recover somewhat. Um, it seems like they would be urging the president to try to implement this by executive order. However, um, as we discussed a little bit earlier, the executive order powers basically that the president has is primarily related to immigration is primarily limited to limiting individuals who are currently outside the US from entering the US. It doesn't really enable him by executive order to, to affect individuals who are in the US in valid legal status currently, um, especially when the H-1B program is statutory. It is in um, the federal code of regulations. It was passed by Congress. It cannot be eliminated completely by the president on his own. Same with the OPT and STEM OPT programs. Those are regulatory. In order to change um, the OPT program, it would require uh, going through the regulatory process, which is a pretty long drawn out process. There are multiple steps. They have to um, publish the proposed rule, wait for a period of notice and comment to receive feedback from the public, and it undergoes a long review process in order to change anything regulatory like the OPT. For example, if um, anyone here is familiar with the kind of saga of the H4 EAD situation, that is also regulatory. It's been, we know the administration has been kind of targeting H4 EADs since 
2017, but up till now, nothing has nothing tangible has been done because it regulatory process is a long process. So we would predict that it is unlikely that the president would be able to do anything sweeping as a matter of you know completely suspending an entire category of visas um, on his own. Um, it's likely he would not be able to do that. But what, what may happen as we've discussed earlier is the administration could always add additional requirements or just make it more difficult, which it already is becoming more difficult right now as a result of just the suspension of premium processing, for example. That is going to have more of a direct impact on a lot of pending applications than an executive order can. We're, we're also getting a lot of questions with regards to if the people are receiving funds from the government, CARE Act payments, can they take the money? Will it be any problem for the public charge? Since H-1B, L-1B holders are cons considered as residents in the IRS definition, um, in the immigration definition, they are not considered as residents, but in the IRS definition, they are considered as residents. If you receive the CARE Act payments, please encash it. You are absolutely within your legal rights to take the CARE Act payment, no problem with it. Um, we were also having um, the issue with regards to the, if the F1, um, no, I'm sorry. If one thing about this CARE Act payments is that if it's an F1 visa and you received a payment, we want you to contact the CPA to make sure that you are complying because F1 students are not supposed to receive the CARE Act payments. If by any chance you receive the CARE Act payments, there must be something wrong the way you file the application. In cases where the people have S4 and L2 dependents and they have an ITIN number instead of social security, they have not received the CARE Act payments. That is because this ITN number, the person is not considered to be the resident for the purpose of the um, for the purpose of the IRS, so that's the reason they did not receive it. So, um, but for those people who are in H one and H four, they have the Social Security number. If they have received the payment, please take it. We get a lot of questions. You know, a lot of people are getting unemployed right now. Can you apply for the unemployment benefits? Here is a rule, um, and a lot of people have apprehension. Will it become a public charge? First thing is that unemployment ben benefits is more like an insurance. It's like an insurance your employer has paid and you're now receiving the payment for it. Uh, however, H-1B holders and L-1 holder, L-1 visa holders are not eligible for unemployment benefits. The reason is that their H-1B and L-1 restricts them to only work for one company. It doesn't have, uh, it, it's not like they can work for any company so they cannot apply for the unemployment benefits. However, if you are a H4 or L2, H4 EAD or L2 EAD, if you're unemployment, you can work. You can, you can apply for the unemployment benefits. Absolutely no problem. Take that. Also, with regards to the unemployment benefits, will it be a problem for you when you apply for the green card? Will it be any problem? If you apply for the citizenship, no, it will not be a problem. USCIS specifically said that in the public charge rule, Unemployment benefits does not come in there. So you can take it if you're eligible for it. Can um, green card holders also accept the unemployment benefits? Um, will it cause any problem for the nationalization application? The answer is they can accept the unemployment benefits. It will not cause any problem. It will not cause any problem if they accept the unemployment benefits for the naturalization, um, it will not cause any problem. Uh, anybody um, has anything else, Rebecca, before we go to Q&A's? Uh, no, got a questions if people have them. Anybody has any questions? Yeah, we have some uh, users who raised their hand to ask a questions. Um, and Unmuting Dinesh, can you ask your hey. question? Yes, thank you, Banu. Hey, Reddy and Rebecca, good afternoon. Thanks for your time, firstly, in having this session with us. And I uh, would also like to thank, especially on the half-hour conference free call sessions that you have daily, 
which uh, really helps us in getting our questions answered. So would like to thank you on that. And uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, let me start with the first one. So uh, if, uh, if I have my I-140 approved uh, with company A, it has been, been approved for six months or more. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's been approved and I stayed with the company for at least six months after it has been approved. And then I left the company A. Later on, I joined company B. And when I filed the H-1B transfer, they used this uh, company A's I-140 and I was able to get a three year of extension or three year of transfer on the new H-1. So my question is, uh, I, what I've heard is until the I-140 priority date becomes current, I could just Still, I could just still use the company A's I-140 and mm -hmm. keep on getting extensions on my. That is right. Not only with this company, you can also get the. You can also move from this company B to company C, also using the company A's I-140. Yes. So my question is, would there be any risk if I just don't get my GC file? I mean, assuming it might take at least ten or fifteen or twenty years for my priority date to become current. So would there be any risk if I do not get my GC file with the current employer that I'm with for the next five or eight years? When you say any risk, it's going to be very hard. Under the current expectations, though, what is your priority date, by the way? August 2015. Well, it's expected to become current according to the statistics in about maybe 25 years, according to our estimate. It, we can go wrong in that, but that's our estimate. So. No, I don't see the, any risk in it, but things can change. What if something comes up, like what Rebecca has said? What if they ban the entire family immigration? I mean, he stops all the family immigration. What if all the family immigration has to be given to the employment-based immigration? So those are some of the things that may. And also, what if the Senate 386 bill, which Dinesh, I am sure, since you come to our conference call, you know that. What if, uh, what if they... They, what if they, the Senate 386 bill passes? That's the only things that I am I can see that can affect. But if things remain as they are, you don't have to worry about I, labor and I-140. Particularly if you are planning to file right now, the perm labor though, Dinesh, I would recommend not to file it right now. We're expecting some hiccups in the perm labor approvals because in the perm labor, they have to prove that there is no American worker available. They have to advertise in the newspaper, post in the workforce commission. You might face a lot of hurdle though. So at this point of time, I don't see in a hurry for you to do it. Even if you think something is going to happen, wait for a year before you file a perm labor. Okay, thanks, Freddie. I have another question. Uh, Good. Yeah, uh, with uh, can one applicant have an employee-based green card application in process as well as a family-based application process? Absolutely no problem with it. You can have both and, the things. It's not a conflict at all. And whatever hits only, we can just go with that. Whatever, whatever comes first, you, you can use that one. The only, the only issue is you can't put the date from the family to uh, business and business to family. Perfect. Makes sense. Yep. And I'll just uh, get off with one last question here. So I uh, recently filed a uh, visiting visa extension for my mother-in-law who's here. So it's been six months she's here and with the COVID things, she really can't travel back to India. So we, we did file uh, the extension 45 online. days before, yeah, online, 45 mm -hmm. days before the current one, current I-94 is being expired. So my question is, right now there's no fingerprint uh, appointment being scheduled. There, there was one scheduled, but it got canceled. I mean, we really can't go because the centers have been closed. Mm -hmm. So should I just wait until I get a fingerprint uh, application uh, or uh, or any kind of update from USAS or would should I kind of react in any way if I do not get any update for the next nine, what can for the you next react? three months? What can you I mean, sh sh should we pack our bags if we do not get anything for the next three months? Or... Well, yeah, don't, don't rely on the fingerprints to come in. Don't rely mm -hmm. on the B2 extension to be approved. Whenever the physical circumstances and medical circumstances become better, she can leave. She doesn't have to wait for the fingerprints. If she leaves, it's not going to be adverse for her. 
just be, just because an extra extension is pending and she left they are not going to look negatively for her no but Especially no but the thing is if if how long she can stay like if i want if we want her to keep for 6 months for, yeah, you apply for 6 months you apply for 6 months is right uh 5 months actually i applied okay then it's then it's 5 months okay so as long as i do not hear anything i could still keep her for 5 months but Absolutely. if I, if i hear something based on that decision i need to act that is right if they ask okay. you for coming for fingerprints they will most probably it will not be adjudicated within 5 months oh she will leave the country hopefully in 5 months so that should be fine okay at yes. the most the fingerprints might be done uh, that's it for me Yeah, one other person has a question. So we have, Go ahead. We have an iPhone user. Yeah, hello. Yeah, yeah, thanks for taking my call. Um, actually, my parents are here. Uh, they came uh, like uh, almost like in, uh, in the month of November. Um, uh, they, their I-94 is expiring this uh, May end. so do i need to file a extension using i539 form or i i heard like the extension is happening automatically even though the i94 expired uh, expires also for 90 days is it true or do i need to pay like around like for 400 to 500 dollars and and uh, take the extension for them because uh, right now the there are no flights to india rebecca Yeah, like we mentioned earlier there aren't any automatic grace periods uh even if the intention is to depart and the only reason they cannot depart is because there are no flights or it's the health situation. Even in those circumstances there's no automatic grace period. So yes, uh in the situation you should file the I539 application for your parents. We understand that it's you know it's an additional filing fee that otherwise you wouldn't have had to pay but um it it really is the only option right now besides them basically going out of status which you don't want them to do because if they do the visa stamp that they have in their passports is going to be automatically validated invalidated um so you do want to get that i539 application filed for them and at least have the receipt notice as proof that that you try to file something for them what you may be able to do in order to cut down on some of the filing fee costs for the B2 extension application it's filed on the I539 form which is available online and you can file it online if you want to however um if you file online you're unable to group family members into the same application um when there are family members who are applying together like your parents um they can file on a single i539 form but in order to be combined and pay filing fee they have to file on the paper application so you may want to consider that filing on the paper application to include both of them at the same time then you only have to pay one filing fee yeah but okay. you still need to pay two f- uh, fingerprint fees two biometrics fees biometric fees which is $85 but filing fees will be one fees as rebecca has pointed out if wife and husband are there you can include but you cannot do online filing for for two people Together. okay so uh, yeah thank you so um, uh, are you saying uh, to uh, do the paper filing but i see the uscis is closed uh, like do i need to um, send that ship it to them or yeah everything is working we are working i'm going to office every single day uscis is working we're getting the approvals rfis uh, denials approvals everything is normal okay so do i need to just ship it my documents to them right that's right okay thanks so much any more questions yeah we have a uh, rama um you can go ahead and ask your question rama can you ask a question i think he's still muted unmuted her now okay hi can you hear me now yes we okay can. yeah thank you so um i have a question like i'm with employee employer a with outside of us okay and uh, my 
firm and I-140 got approved from employer B. Okay, I-140 is approved as consular processing for more than six months now. So my question is, I have a position in US for, for my company A. Can I use that I-140 to move to US after this COVID is over? You said your I-140 is approved in the consular processing, is it right? Yeah, with employer B, yeah. Yeah, so you already counted towards the H-1B number before? Is that right? Yeah, I was, in... I, yeah, I, was uh, I was in US for six years, then moved to Canada a year and a half ago with employer A. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I don't see any problem in you using the I-140 that is approved in the consular processing for company B. Um, you can use that to move to USA on company A's H-1B. Okay. I absolutely. never work for, yeah, I never work for company B, does that? You don't have to work for company B. Okay. One, one precaution that I would recommend though is that I want you to file a Freedom of Information Act on this I-140. By any chance, it's been revoked or anything like that. Even if you it's... filed H-1B, I would still want it's online. It's called, type in this one, USCIS FOIA. Just file it, ask for a copy of the I-140 petition. Even okay. if your company has given it, you need to have this one in the long term with you. Okay, got it. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uday, you want to go to the next question? Yes. Peja. I, I have some questions here from the, I got some uh, messages from the chat here. Uday, can I go ahead? Yes, yes, Rahul. Um, the question is that the person filed an H-1B, this is a question from PB. The per, he got a question, um, uh, he filed an extension while the extension is progressed. He went outside the country, he came back. Now his I-94 that he got it with the extension is different than that of the I-94 that he received it when he entered into the United States. What action he needs to take it? The best thing is called automatic revalidation. You can go to Mexico or Canada and you can enter back into the country and then you will be given a proper I-94. I was being told, I don't know Rebecca, that the Canada has blocked the people to go in and Mexico has yeah. also blocked the people to go in. But I was being told that people went to the Canadian border and then returned back and they gave the new I-94. I have not got the confirmation, but this is the information that has been provided. Yeah, officially the US-Canada and US-Mexico borders are closed until at least May 20th um, for any non-essential traffic. So any tourism, um, even any work visas or work travel, unless it is for healthcare or the supply chain, that sort of thing, they're blocking most border crossings unless you are a, you know, in one of those essential businesses. But we have been hearing different, it sounds like enforcement or treatment at different ports of entry along both borders is a little bit different and seems to be just depending on the CBP officers that happen to be there. Um, so but there is no, there is no hurry for this guy to immediately yeah. do it. Yeah. You, you can, you can wait until the things open up and there's no hurry. You have to, it's an I-94 mismatch. Sometimes this causes problems in the driving license, but you don't have that much hurry. I mean, you're not going to fall out of status or something bad is going to happen to you. So you can wait until the things open up and then go to Mexico or Canada. And even if your passport stamping expires, you can go to Mexico and you can come back. It's called automatic revalidation. Only to Canada and Mexico though, um, not to India if your passport expires. Um, so you could go to and correct that I-94 thing. Do well, you have any more people to ask question? I have a lot of people ask. Um, Um, one question from Gautam that came out in the chat, Rebecca, is perm has been applied in February end 2020. Any idea how long it's going to take for you to get the approval? I would say recently it's been about five months 
from the time it's submitted until approval. Um, there is a good possibility though that that five month processing time is going to increase um, since you know, just as a reaction to the, the COVID and unemployment rates, um, you know, the unemployment rates affect the PERM process the most because the PERM process is where the employer needs to prove that there are no U.S. workers available for this particular position. So in previous financial downturns, we have observed that PERM processing uh, increases, the processing times increase, and the number of audits increase, which would also increase the processing time. But so far, I believe from our, our office's PERM department has been reporting about five months. So hopefully that remains, but um, yeah, it's likely to. Increase. Most of this labor department and USCIS officers, they were already working from home. Now, um, you know, with the COVID, the situation should have been better for them. The reason is that previously they could go to movie. I mean, they can get a haircut, you know, or they can go to they can go to ball game. Right now, everything is banned. They can't even get a, anything. So they have to sit and work. So they should improve the timing though. Uh, that's my hope. Uh, but as of now, we have not seen a significant delays. The only delays what we have noticed is uh, mostly where person-to-person -person meeting is there, especially the fingerprint. In the fingerprint, the officer actually practically has to touch the hands of the person. And that is right now is scary. I mean, they're not healthcare workers. So uh, that those kind of things is a delay, but overall we have not seen any delay. Now we know that premium processing has been suspended, um, but we also noticed that a little bit improvement in the timing, especially in the I-140s, where it used to take a long time, they're approving in the normal processing faster. Uh, H-1Bs are also getting adjudicated a little bit faster than before. Uh, as such, we have not noticed much delays, uh, you know, except where the fingerprinting or where the uh, officer and uh, client has to meet. That's where we have noticed the problems. But otherwise, not much delays in the administration. Ball has this question, Rebecca. Um, is it legal to join the second master's and get a day one CBD? Uh, in our opinion, no. Um, this is based on years of observations of filing change of status applications from F1 to H1B, where the person used day one CPT. And for years now, those change of status applications have been denied on the basis that USCIS determined that use of day one CPT was not considered valid maintenance of F1 status. Um, so that has been our office's position for quite a while now that use of day one CPT is not uh, valid maintenance of F1 status because I mean, F1 status is for a student visa. Um, these colleges that are issuing day one CPT are essentially issuing you know, blanket full-time work authorization and telling you that you can just take care of all your classes within a couple of weekends over the semester, which defeats the purpose of the F1 visa. Um, it's not meant to be primarily a work visa. It's primarily a student visa for you to study and attend school and work authorization is sometimes given incidental to that in order to supplement what you're studying with hands-on training and work experience to supplement your degree program. Um, so our position is that it is not legal necessarily. And um, we know that it's, um, it is difficult. There aren't that many options, especially if you haven't been selected in the lottery. And there are these schools that are just issuing it, um, you know, without asking for any requirements and allowing rolling admissions periods. But we have observed over and over USCIS denying those change of status applications. And recently, in towards the end of last year, before the consulates shut down, we also noticed that consulates we're also uh, looking very closely at day one CPT. Even people who had been in H-1B status for years, if they had day one CPT 
at any point in their F1 history, even if it was five, six years ago, um, the consulates have been giving them difficulty. They've been put in 221Gs. Some people have had their visas denied. Um, there have been people who have been stopped by CBP at the border if they had day one CPT. So it is definitely um, on the government's radar. Even though these DSOs are issuing it, the government does not consider it valid. I got a question from Samson in the group chat. He's asking, his I-140 has been um, approved in February of 2020 with company A. He's working with company B. Um, he doesn't have an intention to join company A immediately, but the company A is forcing them to join company A. Is there anything that he can do to make sure that I-140 is not withdrawn or retain the priority date? No, uh, if the company B withdraws within six months after the I-140 is approved, uh, um, that I-140 or third palm labor cannot be used at all. Um, you cannot use the priority date. You cannot even use it for filing the H-1B extension if it has been withdrawn within 180 days after it's been approved. Samsung, you know, in general though, I for, for Indian nationals, Having an I-140 approval and having it approved for more than 180 days is practically the green card. I mean, there is no other green card right now. You know that green card is not going to come to you in the next 100 years. So the only green card that you have is if you have an I-140 approval, the practically you can use it to keep on getting the H-1B. And if so, certain times where you don't have a job, you want to go to India, you go to India, you can come back at any time in your life if the I-140 has been approved for more than 180 days. I mean. Anytime, you can come in one year, two years, 10 years, 20 years back into this country on a H-1B if you have an I-140 approval. So it's a golden opportunity. I don't blame why company B is forcing you to join them, otherwise withdraw it. I mean, that's the whole reason for which why they filed for I-140. So uh, I, I would recommend to be very careful because if you don't get the I-140 approval, you'll be in a big loss. Would you have anybody else to ask questions? Yeah, we have Teja online. Uh, I've unmuted. Uh, Teja, you can you can go ahead and ask your question. I think he has also typed in uh, in the chat. Uh, his question is: My H-1B is valid until August 2022. My company is filing GC prevailing wage uh, filed. Should we file the labor after the after this step, or should we wait for another year before they apply for it? Rebecca, you got a question? Um, if, so it sounds like the prevailing wage determination has already been filed. If that's the case, you have a limited amount of time to use that prevailing wage determination. Um, so it may not be valid next year. Um, so if that prevailing wage determination has already been submitted and it comes back as basically what the company was expecting. Um, you know, like Rahul was saying earlier this year, if your labor is not already filed this year may not be the best time to do it. Um, yeah, but what if there's, their six year is coming nearby, Rebecca? Yeah, if your six year limit is coming up and you don't have another I-140 approval already, then you need to get the labor filed and get the I-140 approved as soon as you can. So the six year limit issue is, is different. You, you're not able to extend the H-1B without that. Let me see, okay, so I see Tage's comment. His H-1B is valid until August, 2022 currently. So, but yeah, if you don't have any other I-140, we don't know how long the labor processing times are going to take, how long premium processing is going to be suspended. So even though August, 2022 seems like a long time away, I would probably proceed with the labor certification if the company is able to. Lata has this question online uh, that she got laid off in March um, and her 60 day period is ending in May of 2015. Can she convert into B2? Yes, if because of the current conditions, you can convert into B2, you can file for the B2 expect B2. From B2, do not expect to move back to the H-1B, guys. I mean, that's one thing that I would say is that 
because B2 is going to take a long time. It's practically impossible for you to move back into H1. What you could do if you get a job offer um, after you file a B2 application, you can file a consular processing and go to India and get the stamping and come back. But do not expect that you do, do not expect that you, do not expect that you can convert from B2 to H1B again. Now you're telling that if you get a job offer, Lata is telling if she gets a job offer before May 15, can she file a H1B? Yes, you can. If it's within 60 days, you can. Typically, I would recommend that you do not file a B2 application. If it's May 15th, file on May 12th, May 10th, somewhere around that period of time. So that you, well, which actually May 10th is right now. So sorry, um, May 10th is uh, tomorrow. Um, yeah, if you, if, you, if you get a job offer within May 15th, it's not only job offer, they must file an LCA. They must receive an LCA. Um, they must file the H-1B application. That's most probably unlikely before May 15th. So don't dream that you are going to get a job offer. They're going to find an LCA and file a H-1B before May 15th. I would strongly recommend you file a, a B2 application. The second thing that Lata is telling is that I will request my employer to not withdraw the H-1B. They are obligated to withdraw the H-1B. There's no option. They have to withdraw the uh, H-1B. Even if they don't withdraw, they do withdraw. It doesn't matter. Your 60 days start, uh, starts counting once you stop the job. So you will be in trouble if you don't file for the B-2. And please do not hope to convert into B-2 to H-1. B2 is taking about a year's time right now with the fingerprints. So in a year's time, and you have to file one more B2 application, if you file a B2 to H1, they are not going to approve the B2 to H1. It will go to the consular processing. You can't work while B2 to H1B is pending. So for all reasons, it's better that you file a B2, you go to India when the things get better, and you can always come back. If you try to linger around in this country on the B2 applications and other things, your chances of getting a consular processing and getting the thing approved there will go down very significantly. I have seen two recessions. Uh, Rebecca was there in the first recession that we went through. She just joined our office at the time. Um, but I have had another recession in 2000. Uh, in 2000, and we had a recession in 2009. So when this recession happened, though, I mean, a lot of people moved back to the home country and came back when the things turned out to be very good. If you're going to stay in the country, you're going to drain your money, you're going to drain your resources on all these filing fees and other things, you're not going to achieve anything. My recommendation is that if you don't have a job, try to move back, you can always come back. You will not be subject to cap. You're already being counted towards the H-1B, you're not subject to cap. Are there any more questions? Danda Modi, iPhone, you have a question you can ask. Yeah, hey, hi. Uh, my question is regarding H-1B premium processing. So will there be a premium processing? I mean, will there be a chance that premium processing is getting open for 2021 fiscal year? It's hard to say. Um, our, uh, when UCIS suspended premium processing in March, they didn't give any timeline or indication of when they would open it back up. Um, our estimate, I, I would say that I don't expect premium processing to be available uh, this summer. I would say at the very earliest, maybe the fall. Um, but I think it also depends on the on the COVID situation on how that goes too. Yeah, I um, one thing is that this situation, what we are in. I mean, no experience as ever. We learned first world war. We learned second world war. We missed out that more people died and on Spanish flu, we missed it out completely. I mean, it's a fault. And right now there are 6 billion opinion on when, how the COVID will be done. So Rebecca's is one of that 6 billion opinion and she's not an expert, I'm not expert. So we'll have to wait how these things will turn out too. Uh, but I, I pretty much, I, I will give my opinion in that 6 billion opinion. Most probably it will not be done by October of, first of 2020, uh, the premium process might not come back. Yeah, Rahul, we have it. Uh, meanwhile, we, we can take a question in uh, from YouTube live channel. Uh, okay. Patricia has a question 
my H1B application for last year has been rejected. So I opened an MTR to reconsider their decision. It is still open and no update since November 1st. That says the case is received. What are the chances are of approval? And my application uh, for new H1B this year has been picked in the lottery with the same employer with whom uh, the previous one was rejected. OPT expires by July. Will I be able to receive approval for one of my applications by October? Okay, so it sounds like the you this person went through the lottery again this year and thankfully was selected, which is good news. Um, in that situation where the same employer has a pending motion to reopen for a denied case, and then there's also another H-1B application that was selected in the new lottery, that employer is going to eventually need to decide which one to go with. You can't really have both of them ongoing at the same time because they're the same employer and we're both filed through the lottery. Um, yeah, that's very common that the appeal would still be pending right now. Um, the appeal processing times are very long, like eight to 10, 12 months sometimes. And so it doesn't surprise me that it's still pending, that you've gotten no updates on the MTR. The chances of approval at the MTR stage, it's hard for us to say without knowing the reasons for the denial or what the arguments in the appeal were, but in general, the the odds of succeeding on an H-1B appeal are usually pretty low. The appeals office for H-1B applications is not very favorable to, to overturning denials of the service centers. It's usually only possible in cases where it's an extreme, very obvious error on the part of the service center. Um, so I would usually, in this situation, we would probably recommend that your employer go with the second application, the one that was selected in this year's lottery. Hopefully, um, you know, whatever led to the denial in last year's application can be fixed or changed in this year's application to give it a much better chance of approval. And um, regardless, you should definitely have that application filed by June 30th. So if you were selected in the lottery in the electronic registration in March, you have until June 30th to file that application based on the selection. Make sure it is filed before June 30th um, because after that, the lottery selection will be considered invalid, basically. If it is filed before um, by June 30th, if the H-1B application is filed by the end of June, um, I think he said his OPT is expiring in July. If that's the case, then the cap gap will automatically extend your work authorization to September 30th based on the properly filed pending H-1B application. File it earlier than June 30th, just to make sure you get the receipt notice and that you know it's submitted properly. Lata has this question, continuation. If she's expecting an offer in June 1st, can she withdraw the B-2 application because it will be after um, 60 days of the H-1B and file in the non protanka uh, Lata, we do not advise that you file in the non protank non protank should be used in extreme circumstances. The other problem is that since you, if you file a non protank and you're considered to be still violating the legal status, and, and, if, uh, and there is no premium processing right now, so if the non protank case, which most probably will be denied, and then when you go to the consulate, though, they will look into your entire history to consider what actions you do. So that may get you not allowed to come back into the country forever. So I would strongly discourage. And if you have any more questions, Tata, you may want to contact a lawyer. But I, because I know under, under what intense pressure you are in, I would request that you contact a lawyer, though. Uh, but don't take extreme measures. What we are advising people is that we want everybody to be in legal status possible. And also we are looking into their one year, two year, five year, 10 year future, not the six months future that pe sometimes people under pressure think about. Uh, we are looking into very long term future. We don't want any of those things to be affected for you. So uh, Aruna, um, Aruna Reddy, do you have a question you can ask? Uh, hi, Reddy and Rebecca. Thank you for your time. My question is not related to anything related to I-140, nothing. 
So my husband traveled to India in Feb and his return flight was in April, but it got canceled. And his I-94 is valid up to June uh, 30 only. Uh, currently I'm like five months pregnant. So is there any way that I can do anything from here? His passport stamping is uh, uh, is there until June 30th, is it right? Yes. We're expecting the flights are resuming in March 15th or March 20th. May, you mean to say? Uh, so yeah, May. May. Okay, if in worst scenario, if it is not resumed, then uh, anything that I have to do? or uh, um, Which visa sorry. you are in right now? Sorry? Which visa you are in? H4 visa? I'm plain H1B applicant. I raised my extension last week. Uh, I don't know when it will get up to and all. So you are the main applicant. So you can stay in this country. I don't see any problem for you staying in the country. Yeah, um, if he cannot come into the country by June 30th, okay. okay, he has to he he has to wait until your H1B is approved. But under extreme circumstances, though, he okay. can still apply for a B1 or B2 if it crosses June 30th. Okay. If it is within June 30th, he can come here and then he can apply for the H4 extension. Uh, he is in H4 or H1? H4. Yeah, he can come here and apply for the H4 extension. Even if he comes last week, they will allow him as long as you give him the receipt notice of your extension and they can tell him I'm coming here and I'm going to extend my H4. They, it will not cause any problem. Okay, and if by, any chance, if by any chance it crosses June 30th, and your H-1B is still stuck, he can apply for the B-2 visa to come into the United States. However, I would recommend to contact a lawyer. The reason is that they would assume that he's going to intend immigrant. Uh, when he applies for the B-2, he can explain it very clearly. Look, I've, I'm going to transfer to H-4, but this time I'm just visiting. My wife is a pregnant. She's about to deliver the baby. And he can explain the circumstances he should be able to be granted the B2 visa. So like, can, like uh, how, in how many days will it get approved? I need is, uh, B2 doesn't require any visa approval. It only requires him to apply directly in the consulate. Okay. Thank you. So we have a question from Vini on the group chat uh, about the stimulus check. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, we are in SSN H1B plus I-10 for a baby and spouse. Mm -hmm. uh, why why did not get stimulus check? Is it if not eligible? Is, or... If there is an I-10, um, then there is no stimulus check. Is it right, Abak? Yeah, it seems like we've heard kind of different experiences of people in basically a mix when the joint tax return was filed where one person had an SSN and one person had an ITIN, it seems like the IRS is treating that situation as not eligible for the CARES Act payment this time. Uh, I'm reading out a question from YouTube Live, uh, Surya M. Do we have a do we have to file extension for B two visitor visa at present situation or is it automatically extended? No. I think we answered that. Yeah, Rebecca Zalan answered it. No, it's not automatically extended. I don't know where the rumors are flying around. No, there are only couple of changes that ever happened because of the COVID situations. Can you reiterate them, Rebecca? What happened? Everything else remained the same. Nothing has changed. Can you explain, Rebecca, what are the changes that happened with, because of the COVID? Yeah, the only, the only helpful things that USCIS announced were that RFE deadlines, request for evidence deadlines are extended by 60 days if the RFE was issued between May 1st and July 1st now. Um, so a longer RFE deadline and uh, they'll accept photocopied signatures on the forms if in place of original signatures. Rest, everything remained the same. Your B2 expires. If you don't extend it, your passport visa is automatically canceled. Even if you have a 10 year visa, you cannot enter into the country. That's a major disaster. So please file in time before the I-94 expires online application. If you have used a non protonc argument, you still need to speak with the lawyer. There are some negative consequences because when you go outside, first is if the B2 is automatically 
passport visa is cancelled. And there are consequences that are there when the I-94 expires, you file an application. I would strongly recommend to your personal situation to contact a lawyer to discuss more options. Rebecca, questions um, that came on the chat is that for this year's quota, do you expect any additional H-1Bs to be selected after June 30th? It's possible. It's hard to say because it will really depend on, on the effect of the economic downturn on demand for H-1B visas. So we know from previous economic downturns that usually demand for H-1Bs decreases. And for example, in 2009 through I think 2012, the H-1B lottery never got filled within that first week of April. Um, this year is different because of the unexpected economic downturn, but also the timing of the H-1B filing deadline. I would say in a normal year, it's very unlikely for USCIS to do another round of lottery selections. This year, it might happen. Um, we won't know until July at the earliest whether that is a possibility because everyone who was selected in this year's lottery was selected in March. And like we said earlier, they have until June 30th to file the application. So by June 30th, we'll know how many uh, employers who were selected actually filed the application for their selected employees. If the economic situation is such that, you know, a lot, a significant number of H-1B employers decided that they can't afford to sponsor this H-1B employee anymore, and they decide not to use their selections, UCIS will look at that and they could possibly do another round of selections later in the summer. I would, I would uh, tell the person who has a question that don't think that yours will be selected in that. Um, have you planned your life uh, without it, that would be in the best path. situation for you. Um, the question raised by Suhas, I mean, really good question. There are a lot of people who are working on the day one CPT due to, you know, a lot of the people did not get selected by the lottery. What is the situation? What is the better way out for it? How, why, you know, these questions come to us, so us a lot, you know, what, do we have any other solution for the people to work? We don't, I mean, we're not, you know, we're not the creators of the things. We're just interpreting the law as what we know and as what we see in the practice we do cases, we file cases, so we know those cases, we understand you. I understand the pressure under which people are going through to tend towards going to the day one CPT. And in the Telugu community, yeah, there might be more than 10,000 people. How come all the 10,000 people, are we saying all of them are illegal? Yeah, maybe, I mean, it, it could be. Now, I will tell you one thing though, there are uh, 8,900 educational institutions out of those 8,900 education institutions, only 12 of them have issued or issuing day one CPT. Out of those 12, two of those people's owners are in jail. One is, I'm going to name the universities, Silicon Valley University and Tri-Valley University. Two of them are sting operations. Sting operation is for you to tell a police officer pretends that he's selling a drug, marijuana or something like that. You go by, he will arrest you. That's called a sting operation. The sting operation are done at two day one CPT university. One is University of Northern New Jersey in 2016. And in 2019, we have this Farmington University. All the 600 people were being deported out of this country. Now we do have Cumberland, Campus Bill and Harrisburg University that are issuing the day one CPTs. We are pretty much aware of these universities. If when the case comes to us where the students are going to these universities, what we advise them is from going from day one CPT to H1B, we are doing the consular processing for them. Uh, it's been you know hit or miss in the consulate, but there is no other option other than filing the consular processing. Um, one, as Rebecca has pointed out to you before, um, think of this one, if something you know, something talks like a duck, walks like a duck, eats like a duck, and speaks like a duck, most probably is a duck. What she said is that these universities, I mean, how come? They, they give admission with nothing. You just file online, they give an admission. Even I can get admission to master's in computer science, even though I don't have any engineering or any computer science background. Second, there is no start date for this 
universities. Oh, when does the university start? Sir, when do you want? I mean, that doesn't look like a university to me. Third, they only require six days of college in the entire year. I used to go, when I used to go to law school, I used to go six days to the college every week. And this one requires six days every year. That's surprising. And these are all the conditions where we see that these are fraudulent universities. I mean, these are definitely a fraudulent universities according to our thing. Uh, we may not have a better solution for you, but we cannot tell you to violate the law uh, uh, because we are just interpreting. We have no authority to tell you to violate the law. Any more questions? Uday? So we have, Vish we have uh, Vishnu who is asking a question uh, related to B2. My parents visited the US three times and I have, I have seen there in, in and yeah, out records I, I have, for all the three I, times. I have, seen, I have seen that, that the I-94 record has not been reflecting properly. He can call the CBP office, make sure that he has the passport stamping there's also, there is a, not only the passport stamping of the visa, but also there is a stamp that they do they, they, when you enter into the country available at the time and also the applicant available, uh, the person, that means the father or the mother or whoever that might be, to call the CBP office, they will be able to correct that mistake. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll read a question from YouTube live. Uh, RC is asking this question. I am on H1 right now and it expires on 31st May 2020. My employer has applied for an extension, but I have not received a receipt number yet. Will my ex visa extension process be affected? No, it shouldn't be. Um, as long as the application is considered properly filed. Um, I would say so far we haven't seen that much delay in the service center sending receipt notices, although it's always possible due to staffing shortages. I would say um, another way that your employer can confirm whether the application is properly filed is to check their bank records and look at um, the check that was used for the DHS filing fee. If that check has been cashed, then that means the application has been received and is properly filed, even if you haven't gotten the receipt notice yet. And if they can get an image of the cashed check, usually on the back of it, USCIS prints the receipt number, like the SRC or the EAC number that would appear on the receipt notice anyway. So that might be a faster way to confirm that your application is filed properly. Rajini Chaudhary Nara, do you have a question? Uh, yes, so that I do have. Yeah, good afternoon, Rahul and Rebecca. This is Rajini here. I do have a question. I got my H4 EID for three years starting off this year. That means it's valid till 30th December 2022. But after, got my, after I got my H4 EID, my H1 got approved for only two months. That is like my MTR, which I filed last year. And now I applied for my H1 extension. If I won't get my H1 extension, what were my options? Well, you can just step out to Mexico and come back and activate your H4 plus EAD. Uh, so, so I'm eligible to work from my H on my H4 EAD once I got my no. H4 extension, right? No, no, no. What, what I told was that, let's say, for example, if your H1 extension gets denied, you can go to Mexico, okay, or Canada. You come back, you show them the H1, H, sorry, H4 approval, which you said you have an I-94 until December of 2022. And Rajni, you tell him that you tell them that you're happily married, even though I know you fight with him sometimes. <laughs> uh, you say that you're happily married, uh, and then you come in on H4 and start working. Okay, thank you, Rahul. I'm just kidding with you, Rajni, on that fighting. So I want to read up this question from YouTube live. Sure. Are uh, you reading with it? Someone. Yes, yes. Okay. I have a Canada PR. I can return to US after getting Canadian citizenship on TN visa. Yes. That's the question. First yes. question. They can. I already got my I-140 approved. Oops. Will the 140 still be valid? 
Yeah, one can I apply for a green card and TN visa? Sorry. Um, what do you say, Rebecca? Coming back after the I one hundred and forty has been approved on a TN visa. Yeah, that might be difficult. Um, so the TN, unlike the H one B, does not allow you to have the intention to immigrate permanently to the U.S. So for people in H status or L status, they can have the green card process ongoing, parallel, and it's not a problem. You can go in and out of the country in H-1B status with an I-140 approval, and it's not a problem because of the nature of the H and L visa. The TN visa is not like that. It's technically much more temporary. The TN visa is supposed to be temporary strictly. You're not supposed to intend to immigrate to the U.S. permanently, and the I-140 approval is you know, a statement that you intend to stay in the U.S. permanently. So usually, usually we try not to have our clients who are in TN status travel across the border if they have an I-140 filed or approved. Um, since it sounds like uh, this person is already in Canada right now, so it may be difficult in that case to enter in TN. If you I'm already- thinking, I'm thinking, Rebecca, maybe he already had a H-1B, most probably. That's the reason yeah. he had an I-140. Why can't he come back and H-1B instead of TN? Yeah, TNB, so that would be a much better option. If you've been counted in the H-1B lottery, then come in on the H-1B visa instead. And in, in that will avoid, Then that will avoid the I-140 possible potential immigrant issue. Right. Uday? Yeah, um, seems uh, Dinesh has another question. Hey, hey Dinesh. Yes, I'm here. Hey, Rudy. So uh, previously we were uh, addressing the 60 day grace period and uh, the scenario of being, the scenario of applying a B2 visiting visa and lingering around in United States is not a good option, right? No. So question around that, would if, if a consulting company agrees to pilot H-1B for an in-house project, would that be... Dinesh, we know what an in-house project is. Yes, to be frank, yes, yes. Yes, we all know. Don't enter into these things. These people go to jail. Sometimes they just disappear and we face all the music of them. Okay. They make the money, you and we face the music. Don't so entertain it's, it's these It's not people. advisable to it's get... It's not it. advisable. And yeah. Dinesh, he, this is what practically is going to happen. Believe me with experience. You try to linger in this country, you're going to drain your money like anything. It costs a lot of money to stay in this country. And without a job, it costs a lot more. I mean, it's a lot of strain. I would, since you're already being countered towards the H-1B and things are not going to just magically come back soon. At least that's my expectation. It will take a while. Some of the industries, it may take a while. I mean, this is a pandemic. And, and, and even if we have a magic pill tomorrow, okay? Assume we have a magic pill tomorrow. This is what's going to happen. In Timbuktu, four people die and doctor says, I don't know why they died. Guess what? We are running hex. They're like, I'm scared to death because of Tim, four people died in Timbuktu. So it's going to be a while before this comes back. And I want to conserve your money. I want to conserve your energy. I want you to... Be there in the future, though. Maybe retool yourself because there are certain technologies we're noticing right now. There's an increase in the demand for the H1B, especially for those people who are in the security and certain other e-commerce and certain other things, though. Uh, so we have, we have seen some improvement. Of course, you know, we have seen a lot of layoffs, too. Overall, IT is not as much badly affected as, as the thing. So I want you to back off a little bit, step out to the country rather than hamper your chance forever. Go you try on. to go with these in-house people, they will be caught someday or another, and they will go to jail, and or they just disappear. They just go to India. And now they are going to review all the applications filed, and they may hit with a misrepresentation for you. If you apply for a non-immigrant visa in it with a fraudulent intent, it's called misrepresentation, and that is a permanent bar that you can never come back into this country. Got it. Yep, makes sense, Ready. Thank you. So we are almost a um, couple more minutes before the three thirty. Uh, do uh, there still still three more people who want to ask question? Do you want to take it, Rahul, or yeah, yeah, go should ahead. we conclude? Uh, 
I lived, uh, Rebecca can live if she wants, but she can stay if she wants. No. I will be, we'll be there then. Um, Rama, do you want to ask a question? I am. Hi, thank, thanks for taking my question. Uh, Rahul, it's Rama again. I, it's, a, it's a question I asked you before. Um, I'm with company A outside US. Okay, my company B has filed my permanent I-140. Mm -hmm. It's been more than 180 days. Okay. Yes. So in, in the last time you said like, make company sure that a. it's not, yeah, company B is not revoked my mm -hmm. I-140. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure because my I-140 is not revoked. Because yeah, yeah, I just do that extra step for me, please. Yeah. It's 10 minutes for me. Spend 10 minutes for me, file an online. It's free. It's yeah, I, I do that. I, okay. I do that. So we, can they uh, revoke my application after 180 days? They can revoke, but it won't have a negative, negative impact on you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's what I want to have confirmation. Thank you. You can, even if they revoke it, you can still file the H-1B with company A, company C, company D. You can port the date. You, if you are here on H-1B, your wife is here on H-4EAD. Even if they revoke it, you can file for H-4EAD. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Rahul, I have a question from Mahesh uh, asking um, his brother wants to invite uh, his parents on a visitor visa. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a valid visa, but uh, how soon um, would the situations in US be um, favoring to invite them into US? Well, they have a visa, so we are out. <laughs> they don't. They don't need a visa, right? So it's up to the situation. That requires a COVID expert or health expert, which we are not, and we can give one of the six billion. Everybody has an opinion on COVID right now. So when the flight has a question. Yeah, Yogesh. I'm go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead, Yogesh. Yogesh. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, the stamping. The dates uh, are not available in India. What is other option uh, can try to get and how 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 can I get it? Uh, get in stamp and come back to US again. Are you in US or in Canada? Uh, sorry, I'm US in or... US. US. Okay. Rebecca, you want to answer it? Um, so if you're in the U.S. and your I-94 is valid, you do not need to apply for a visa stamp. The visa stamp is only needed if you are outside the U.S. in order to apply for entry to come back in. That's the purpose of the visa stamp in the passport. So if you're here in the U.S. and you have an approval notice, your I-94 is valid, then you are in legal status and we would recommend that you stay here for now. Definitely don't leave right now since the consulates are closed um you'll just put yourself in a situation where you won't be able to return until they reopen which is uncertain when that will happen like you said you you guess any need for you to go out oh uh, yeah i have some personal reasons to go in there and come back um that's why i'm just checking my n 4 is valid till 2021 August, but well, we, I want we, to... we've, been, we've been told, uh, Rebecca, can you confirm? I have, I have no confirmation of what we've been told, but correct me if I'm wrong, that in the consulates in Canada have opened up the online appointments, though. I don't know how true it is, especially in the end of the May. That's what I was being told, but I have no confirmation for it. I don't have confirmation on that either yeah. yet. You'll have, to, you'll have to wait, Yogesh, until the things open. Okay, so I can go Canada and get have stamping and uh, we don't we don't yeah. know it. This is not confirmed thing. Uh, it just people give information. We have no confirmation on that. You can okay. try and if you get it, please drop an email and let us know. Yeah, sure, sir. Thank you. So, uh, iPhone has another question. Yeah, uh, Rahul. Um, my question is, um, like, like, like I said, uh, this is a question on the B two visa. Like, um, I, I thought the flights will be um, there for my parents to uh, leave this country, but there is expiring by uh, the end of the next week. So, if I file by paper for five three nine and five three nine A, since I have my mom and dad. Uh, do I just uh, uh, send them by a FedEx or something fast travel? Um, for, um, and if I get the notice, that should be sufficient for me? Yeah, that's sufficient. Even if you don't get the receipt notice, if the USCIS has received your application, that will be good. 
but i don't want you to wait until if it's two weeks is there i mean that doesn't look like modi is going to allow any of these people so you may want to you may want to do it you know today itself or maybe tomorrow or maybe monday yes thanks sir so last question teja do you want to ask a question uh, sure uh, uh thanks ready for your time uh, i mean uh, just a follow up question so this is my first h1b and uh, i need to forward it until 2022 is there something i can request the company to delay labor filing just due to the covid situation or we're good, good to go since i already have a couple of years like 5 years to go i mean if they are doing it um if they are doing it do you rebecca still advise them not to if your company is ready to and you know to start the labor and they have not had layoffs um of us workers um there's no harm necessarily in starting early we don't know how how the perm process could be impacted for you know years to come so there's no harm in starting early yeah yeah if any chance if you get the denial from here you can always when you move to a different company you can get the approval from them um we have noticed in 2009 and 2010 that denials were about 30 to 40% though um in in 2019 i would say that the denial ratings are about 5 to 7% and this 5 to 7% are because lawyers doing a poor job kind of things not strategically filing the application most of them are but in 2009 and 2010 was that a lot of resumes came in so nothing wrong in it it's okay to file the labor in i140 if they are filing you don't have to particularly tell them don't file it it's okay hi right. thanks thanks so much if you get denied you can still extend the h1b that's it's already there all right i think uh, um Uh, we'll conclude this uh, session now um, thanks uh, rahul and uh, ms chen uh, for your time addressing all the questions uh, and sharing all your uh, valuable information uh, related to integration uh, we really appreciate that um, and again you all stay safe and healthy uh, anything else rahul and rebecca before we Close the call. Do you want to share anything else? No, thank you. Thank you guys for giving the opportunity uh, to come and speak with uh, Telugu people. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for yeah. having us. Tambo really appreciates that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you.